This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thank you for downloading this programme from BBC Radio 4. For more information, visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. Hello and welcome to the very first Infinite Monkey Cage, a programme about science. I'm Brian Cox, physicist. And I'm Robin Ince, English and Drama BA. Robin, could you just tell the listeners why Robin Ince, BA, English and Drama and Comedian, is presenting a science show? Uh, basically, I think because uh, I am what I would classify as a keen idiot, uh, which I imagine some of the other Radio 4 audience are, which is that we're very interested in science, but at the same time we don't know much about spontaneous symmetry breaking in the electroweak sector of the standard model, and, to be honest, we're slightly scared of it. Well, don't worry about it. By the end of the series, you will be fluent in spontaneous symmetry breaking in the electroweak sector of the standard model. And just to reassure listeners, this show is also available in the form of a graph. Over the next few weeks, we'll be talking about everything from the search for alien intelligence, science conspiracy theory, Theories, religion versus science, overlapping magisteria, non-overlapping magisteria, slime mould communities, and hopefully, if we've got time, the sub-aquatic ape theory, which is my favourite theory, uh, with professors, PhDs and people off the telly, because they don't put enough professors on the telly. <laughs> but in this week's Monkey Cage, we're joined by anatomist and broadcaster Dr Alice Roberts. Hello. And it says here, someone whose early career showed so much promise but has gone drastically downhill since then. That's a bit harsh <laughs> in the script. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Apologies for that. No, no, what you've done there, Brian, is you, you've, uh, you've misread that one. That's not referring to Dr Alice Roberts. I can't oh. believe we only wrote this script. We wrote this script one hour ago and already you've forgotten the meaning of this script. Uh, and cosmologist and comedian Dara O'Brien. And, and the shocking thing was I actually recognised myself from the description of someone who's started <laughs> promisingly and has gone hideously wrong. Yeah. I, I cannot be described as a cosmologist, by the way. Let's get that straight right from the start because I never actually worked as a cosmologist. Yeah. But you did, so, you did study it. I did, I did, right. yeah. I, studied, I, I, I did four years of a theoretical physics and mathematics degree with a specific leaning towards differential geometry and cosmology. So why is it that there are so many comedians that seem to have started life as, as scientists? You know, there's Ben Miller, Dave Gorman, Richard Vranch... Harry Hill. The, I, I have a theory that the way you come up with ideas in, in comedy isn't dissimilar to the way you come up with ideas in mathematics because you compare things to other things, basically. You compare the properties of one thing to the properties of another thing and theref- and from that, hilarity slash mathematical illumination <laughs> lie, right? Depending on what, what are the two <laughs> things you're comparing, right? The so foundation to mass civilization, exactly, all those things. Or a very good joke. But there is also the other thing that even though there are people who have a science background, there are also a lot of comedians who don't have a science background but are very passionate about science. But then actually trying to do stand-up comedy about science, you must have difficulty when you try and tackle cosmology in stand-up. I do, well, I don't, as a rule, try to tackle cosmology in stand-up that often. I'm a little bit close to it, to actually to be able to bring that... Uh, what's all this about? I mean, the best stance in, in comedy is to be the intelligent alien. To have, unfortunately, had the door opened a little bit for you by way of doing a degree means that I'm a little bit too close to it. Now, Alice, you, I, I was thinking, because I think that's why physics is, is hard in any way to do it in comedies, because it's kind of counter-instinctual and most people have no background in it at all. Whereas the evolutionary biology, see, I think that's quite an easy one to do gags about. So, I mean, do you have, when you're, when you're doing a presentation... <laughs> the, journey, the journey of mankind yeah. out of Africa, that's just funny. No, but I'm Hilarious. talking about the other... <laughs> once you get to is, is the purpose of the show to cla- classify all the sciences <laughs> depending on how, how easy they are to make jokes about? <laughs> yes, oh, that is fine. exactly okay, it. I didn't realise that. That's, fine. that's, that's, that's good. Cool. I'm on board with that project. <laughs> uh, and that's what you want to do. So, Alex, do you, I mean, this is what I, I love is finding out when I've sometimes been to conferences, there are gags that I don't understand at all and you must have when you're doing a lecture... Do you have your kind of opening gag? This will get people into the idea of mitochondrial Eve. Watch out. I've had some very, very funny answers to things when I've been marking medical student exams over the years. And there was this one bit where I was asking them what the, what the a feature that stabilised the ankle was. And somebody wrote down Spanish ape. And I, I was really foxed by this. And then eventually a colleague said, oh, God, I know what it is. And I said, well, have you been lying to them? And he said, no. I said that the two bones at the ankle grip onto the the talus, which is the top bone of your foot, and they form a sort of spanner shape. And obviously the student had just written this down. And it kind of, you know, it's like esoteric knowledge. And, of course, what's nice about anatomy and the stuff that I do is it's not actually esoteric. It's quite accessible. 
Well, that's what I found difficult, is when I found out that the song about the head bone connected to the neck bone actually does have some inaccuracies in it, which is one of the reasons that I didn't do very well in anatomy. This is the problem with a lot of 30s songwriters. It's not, it's not uh, a mnemonic for an exam, that particular song. I don't think, that, I don't think that's how it was invented. <laughs> it wasn't passed from anatomy student to, to anatomy student. Because uh, why would you put a chorus in? If you've got a, a, a mnemonic, why would you have a bit that goes, dem bones, dem bones, in the middle of it? Like, that'd be, that'd that, be that was one of the problems that, I think that was marked slow, down for racism uh, that would, in the modern age. Blow you up during a vibe. Uh, if in the middle of it all you had to pause midway to the rib cage and go dum, 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 bones, and then and then start again. Like. It's all right. Well, we've talked about the fact because uh, we're, sorry, we're, this, we're not mainly going to be talking about uh, how science and comedy mix, but it's just because the first one and we've just yes, three as to because uh, I we were I originally we talked about the fact that bonobos are, are a fantastic ape uh, to create humour from because they're the only uh, ape with a fashion sense. Not merely the the fact that they rub genitals together to uh, ease a fight situation, but also if they find a dead rat or a cockroach, uh, they place it on the head and march around. Uh, <laughs> and that's true; they parade around, showing off their hat. Really? They're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's why again, why physics I find oh, much harder. It, this went television because there's three people just staring at me completely <laughs> blankly. I just want to report that because it's raining. Yeah. Anyway, Alice, you. Recently, this series about the out of Africa theory, the fact that the whole of humanity actually began from Africa. Now, it's an amazing human journey, isn't it? The great human journey. The incredible human journey. The incredible human journey. I said, uh, I, said to, I, said to I found BBC, it great and amazing. Can I make it quite clear? I said to the BBC, you can't call it the incredible human journey because the incredible journey is a story about, I think, two dogs and a cat it's trying to find their way home. <laughs> yeah, it is. That would be fantastic if it was two dogs. Well, basically, what you're saying is that humanity's family moved uh, and humanity <laughs> followed them. Did you think that these programmes have been any way controversial? Because I know that you got a lot of letters. I mean, did, did you expect that anthropology, the, the human journey, would be a controversial programme? I don't think so, because um, we were presenting something which is very much the consensus view that most anthropologists agree about, but it was quite strange, actually, and it, and it, it almost seemed that some of the criticism of it or some of the some of the responses people were bringing about it were more to do with the fact that they felt uncomfortable with the idea that humans had actually evolved, which, which I found quite shocking, because I kind of started off with the, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a given. At what point? Because we're all hearing this debate going on and on and on and on and on, and people who just went essentially ram their fingers in the ears and go la 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 la. And at what point do you have to go? Fine, go for it. Knock yourselves out. The rest of us are going to carry on looking up stuff and finding stuff and learning things. You know, is it important this particular debate, or is it just is it just time wasting at this stage? I don't think it is time wasting, and I think that it's still important to engage with people, even if they're starting off from the point of view of really not wanting to believe you. And I think that if you lay the evidence out on the table, and certainly when it comes to the evolution of our own species, we've got we've got such a lot of evidence out. And also we've got a lot of evidence from different branches mm. of science. And you kind of think, I can't believe that people can look at all of the evidence I've kind of laid out here and not engage with it and start to think, maybe there is something to it yeah. after all. It becomes... Maybe the fact that you've got some, a story coming out of genetics and fossils and archaeology and it all seems to be coming together, yeah. surely there's something in it. Oh, but it'll never come together as there are two chapters at the start of a book uh, which explain this very neatly. And plus, how often do you need to hear the words, well, you say it's only a theory, uh, <laughs> without having to go through the definition of what a theory means? I mean, of, of all the sciences, the paleontology is one of the ones. Like, I mean, somewhere between when I was in school and when I grew up, the brontosaurus died out again uh, because it was around and I remember being in all the little books of dinosaurs when I was a kid and then when I became an adult and I had to buy the book for my own kid suddenly no brontosaurus anymore well the brontosaurus is gone the brontosaurus is gone yeah. is it? yeah I know no. Yes, yeah, the brontosaurus is gone. Know yeah. that it's the only animal to have become extinct twice feathers is a new one so Ooh, when feathers, I was growing yeah. up dinosaurs never had feathers in my day Dinosaurs didn't. And now they do. Like I've got a friend who works float. on feathered dinosaurs in China. He showed me a feathered dinosaur about the size of a chicken. It looked a bit like a chicken. I'm sure it wasn't just a chicken that he dressed up to look like a dinosaur, though. It was fossilised for a start. But I really like the idea. He said, do you know that some of the Tyrannosaurus Rex family actually had feathers? That's the best, that's age, because that's now my favourite dinosaur, because my favourite used to be, you know, when we were, uh, at least three of us, when we were young, they still didn't know why dinosaurs had died out. And uh, there was a maverick scientist who had the belief that there was a plant uh, which had special properties, um, which would help basically help the dinosaurs go to the toilet. And uh, the plant died out, and then the dinosaurs actually died out from constipation. No. That was in the, in the early 70s. That was one of the theories. But 
Feather Tyrannosaurus Rex wins. Brontosaurus models getting thrown out. Waste of time that was for the whole week. People cling to say that science is dogmatic. That science tells you exactly. Mm. They don't realize that, like, I mean, that physics itself threw out all physics twice, at least, in the last yeah, century. Yeah. The, uh, um, and just went, oh, God, we've been wrong with this all along. Let's go with the new paradigm. And, the, and it does it all the time. New ideas come through. Do, how do we as a culture educate people to respect the scientific method? To, to understand that that's the best view we have at the moment based on the current evidence. And whilst it may change, it's very difficult to, to get to a better view by, as you say, uh, just belief or reading it in a in, magazine. Yes, or the, I, I think there, there's two problems you face, right? And, and, and I, feel I don't work in these industries, so they're not problems I necessarily face. But two problems that you face, he says, pointing to Alice and to Brian here, which is that people inherently dislike people who are smarter than they are. Uh, and that goes back to school. And people like their own opinions and like the fact that there are many things in which their opinions are extremely valid uh, and dislike being told there are topics in which your opinion doesn't actually count for anything. Mm. And people don't like to hear that. We live in a culture where people are constantly expressing their opinions of things. Yeah, I have a right to my opinion. I have a right to my opinion. My opinion should be heard. My, sh- my opinion should be regarded as equally valid as anyone else's opinion. And there are certain topics which that is nonsense. There was a thing on the Daily Mail website. And the Daily Mail website, this isn't actually a comment of the Daily Mail website, bizarrely. They had a thing about a story that processed meat can cause greater instances of colon cancer. Uh, this is the idea. They eat too many sausages, basically, that a few have some certain percentage increase in the risk of colon cancer over the course of your life, right? And it was a perfectly reasonable study, mapped out, and they, they alerted people to the findings of this. And underneath it, there was a quiz saying, do you think sausages cause cancer? <laughs> and underneath the story which said, sausages cause cancer, 80% of people had said, no, sausages don't cause cancer. <laughs> and you're kind of going, well, I'm sorry, there's, there's literally nothing you can do in that situation. Do you think sorry. people had just turned to the quiz they rather than actually reading well, the article? Well, they, they read it just in, as somebody... <laughs> oh, this is fun. <laughs> oh, <a> sausage <laughs> quiz. And, and, uh, people were Googling sausage and quiz uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and scroll down to find the button they could press uh, rather than that. I just think, this isn't Jedward. You're actually, your opinion isn't right. <laughs> it can be dangerous, can it? Particularly... Childhood vaccinations, for example, yeah. that's a very dangerous thing to have an opinion on. You need to trust the experts. It's like getting on a plane and saying, I don't think the wings should be like that. I just don't like those wings. I want cubic wings. <laughs> but, you know, and you, don't, you, you trust the aerodynamicist. Or you don't go to the cockpit on a plane and say, I think I could do this better. Can I the power of the, yeah, you don't get that, do you? You don't get aeronautical quacks. You're doing, me- you're doing quacks. medicine, don't you? Where are the Why? aeronautical well, quacks? Look, I think science is the art, I suppose, of of teaching yourself to look at evidence and remove your prejudice. And it is very difficult. Because, but is that because so, common so, sense the, the, is overrated? Uh, is common sense, well, I think, maybe. I think science is the the that we've learned as a species to remove remove our filters as far as we can. You know, science is the art of looking at evidence dispassionately. And you have to be taught it because you react to things. I mean, we're all irrational at heart, I suppose. We're irrational beings. And so I think that's the value of science. I think there is, there is an element of people complaining about scientists being, and even this discussion, I'm sure there are people who hear this and go, oh, look at that, how smug. They all agree with each other. Where's the other dissenting voice? And that's not necessarily because two of us aren't scientists at all. I certainly come from a very humble position of knowing just how much work those who actually work in science do to keep up with all this kind of information and how long it takes to train for this. And that drives me insane on, their, on, the, on behalf of people who do all this work that somebody can just make up stuff. So it seems to me the consensus, at least around this table, that science is valuable. So given, given the importance, how much would you guess that we actually spend on scientific research in this country, given that it underpins our economy, our future as a civilization? How much, how much would you guess? What does that include? When you say, how, what, is well, that, how much, what research, is it, what does that include? So, so, so all the universities, the medical research council, the physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, space exploration, CERN, absolutely everything. I mean, there's a famous example of uh, when the Apollo program was on and people asked uh, American citizens, how much are we spending going to the moon? It was like half of our GDP, you know, billions and billions and billions. And, and in fact, it was a tiny percentage. So, I mean, how much do you... If you had to guess, I mean, As if you don't know, GDP. I mean, yeah, how much would you think the whole the whole lot costs? Four, five. I'm gonna go for ten. Yeah, I'd say ten, twelve. Really, it's not point four percent of GDP. It's some. It's about six, six and a half billion pounds a year, which pays for everything. And then 
Um, the proposal is that funding decisions for scientific projects should be 25% based on impact. So what do you think impact is? Uh, is that impact is a that business, let's say, automatically understands the implications of it and can sell it. That's what I'm presuming impact means. Yeah. Or not necessarily business, but let's say that it is a very specific, it's a new type of MRI machine, something very commercial or very obviously marketable. But how do you measure that? Because, I mean, is it impact in terms of number of lives saved or amount of money that that, that technology then generates? I, I, think, I, I think how quickly it, it can be put into production or, um, or sold. Yeah, exactly. Don't, exactly. don't an awful lot of scientific ideas come from a place which is much more blue skies where actually we cannot predict what the impact is going to be? This is this is assuming that you're going to be able to predict exactly what the impact of some kind of scientific discovery is going to be before you'll decide whether to fund it. Presuming that the parallel to this would be if they said to comedians, not that we're publicly funded, with the, but the, if they said to comedians, if you could just do jokes about topics we already have, uh, <laughs> because we like these topics, but these topics have worked in the past, if you could just do new jokes about these exact topics again and again and again. Or was the immediacy of the laugh would be the graph, which is going, I mean, that routine was great, but we, we were seeing that that was nine seconds before the laugh, and I feel that it would actually benefit the audience more. If they get a laugh within the first four seconds, that means the routine could be over within nine minutes, and then they can leave, whereas the way we're looking at the moment, we're waiting for 23, 24 minutes before you get to the conclusion of your set. So therefore, what we need is a far more immediate laugh and therefore an immediate exit. But Darwin wouldn't even get to the point of trialling any new material, because yeah, he wouldn't would. have the funding no. to do it. No, you would. I mean, the process that you go through at the start of a show where you basically sit in a room and go bananas and throw ideas at a wall and then go in front of an audience with a sheet of paper and go, is this something? Is there anything in this? That's all gone, presumably, under this current scheme. Um, I, I still find it fascinating, the the whole way that, that science tries to get funding. And uh, because I'm not a science, I don't necessarily have a great comprehension of it. So I've attempted to learn more this week. By I went to eavesdrop at uh, the Pros from Dover Laboratory. Oh, Morris, you're back early. I think I may have had a breakthrough with our gel electrophoresis Oh, problem. Desmond, what's uh, the use? Well, it, it just means that we... I'm uh, afraid the research council has refused to renew our funding. What? Damn it! Do they not see the importance of sizing and quantification of proteins during purification or protein expression experiments? No, no. They're funding a self-ironing shirt. Not Thompson over at UCL. I'm afraid so. They saw him on The One Show with Adrian Childs. Why can't we be on The One Show? And why do our funding applications always fail? It's as if success is in inverse proportion to long-term importance. Go on. Well, if S, success, mm -hmm. is a product of P, populist appeal, and the inverse of long-term importance... So one over I. Correct. And factoring in a telegenic front person like Thompson, let's call it the Vorderman effect, V, we have P times one over I to the power of V... Uh, may I? Oh, yes, of course. Ah, oh, no. oh, that's good. Interesting. Now, what's A? Attenborough. We know that if it's just had a series on, all funding moves away from the arts and humanities to sciences. My God, Morris, we may have discovered the formula for successful funding applications. Steady on, old man. We'll need exhaustive trials, and for that, we'll need funding. So in order to fund further research into successful funding application, we'll need to be successful in our application for funding. Damn. Hold on, Desmond. If we're unsuccessful and the Research Council turns us down will be in an even stronger position to apply for funding in order to discover exactly why they refused us funding. Which could take decades, but which will need funding. A strong argument, then, for being unsuccessful in our application. Precisely. Let's not apply at all. That will guarantee that we're unsuccessful and ensure further funding. Thus beating the Research Council at its own game. Excellent. This is very exciting. <gasps> By the way, we, uh, we have to be out of here at four. The uh, lease on the lab runs out then. Right, eh? And they want our microscopes back. Mm. What time does the job centre open? I've got no idea. I've got a job in a pub. Ooh, bar work. Well, that seems perfectly logical to me. Obviously, level of celebrity plus product equals likelihood of funding. Well, you know, I mean, it sounds funny in a way, but actually there is a genuine amount of concern in the research sector, the university sector, about these proposals. So I went to speak to the current science minister, Lord Drayson, to put our concerns to him. What's he like? I've always wondered. He's lovely. Oh. I think whilst our sketch is meant to be funny, yep. as a working scientist, there is often a feeling that you listen to what the government says, which is quite often in some difficult-to-understand management speak about... You know, Are you saying I speak in management speak? <laughs> no, but you're, you're, <laughs> you're not the person that talks to us. It gets filtered down through okay. a lot of well, I'm people who've been trained in the art of management. <laughs> and, and, then, and then what scientists tend to do is try to work out try to optimise their strategy in order to 
get the money for the oh, research right, that right. they're going to okay. do anyway. Well, look, and this scientists, is the are, very, scientists okay. are very good at okay. that. Well, because... this is a great opportunity, right? It's the science minister speaking here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, just do excellent science. That's what it's about. It really is. The government sees that the success that we've had in the past is because we focused on excellence. It's about the quality of the science. So the most important thing that all scientists need to focus on is the quality of, of what it is that they do. I, I look at the science budget, and I, I think perhaps you do as well, and, and I won't put words into your mouth, but I look at it and think it's ludicrously low, not, not in Britain, but just in general. I mean, let, let's say Britain's around the average. Then th these levels of funding set against figures like... 6.4% of UK GDP is physics-based. Or like the studies of the economic impact of Apollo, which is something very yeah, dear yeah. to my heart. I mean, the Apollo program was one of the reasons I went into science. Um, yeah, I'm, the, the numbers absolutely. are astonishing. You, yeah. you have, for example, for every dollar spent, $14 came back into US economy. That's yeah. a, the Chase study of the impact of Apollo. Or CERN, I mean, the World Wide Web, which Tim Berners-Lee says could not have been invented anywhere else, has made an incalculable mm -hmm. contribution to the world economy. How am I to understand the fact that we spend, as a world, so little on scientific research when it delivers so much to our civilization? Well, I, I agree with everything that you've said. And I think that, for me, the most pragmatic argument for why this economic impact in research assessment is so important is that future science ministers who come after me need to be able to make a stronger case in government to say exactly what you've said and be able to point to the data and being able to, to stand in front of the Treasury and say, look, it's indisputable <laughs> proof from this economic assessment, from the impact assessment that we do of scientific research, that the more we invest in science, the, the better impact that we have for our country. And those two, therefore, are linked. If we want to be able to spend more, more on science in the future, which we absolutely need to be able to do, we have to show the way in which that happens. So, so Alice, you were shaking your head at points there, but it seems reasonably sensible. I mean, what what the science minister is saying is that he wants to be able to make an argument to the Treasury, presumably. I always wonder why it's not possible to just go to the Treasury and say, look, right, <laughs> science is really good. It delivers economic impact. But you can't, it appears you can't talk in those words. So he's saying that he, the scientists themselves need to provide the data that tells the Treasury that our whole civilization is built on science. But you were already providing examples of how science did that without having to bring in a whole new bean counting mechanism. When he says the best benefits for society, I want to know, as being a non-scientist, how many scientists are working deliberately for the detriment of society? How many are looking many, for, for funding? Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, that, that's the main science, <laughs> scientist well, we know. You can't discount the amount of good work evil scientists have done in just moving, say, weapon systems along or, or armies with scubas uh, on their back or funneling out of, of, uh, of volcanoes uh, to put rocket systems into. I mean, that kind of stuff, a lot of work was done for, by bad people. You know, Ebola virus I'm, licorice, yeah. which didn't get funding for the British government, <laughs> and but has done very well abroad. <laughs> and of course, Werner von Braun. So the uh, so don't well, von Braun is a very interesting example actually because he was the father of Apollo. Yes, yeah, so, so the yeah. whole wonderful um, adventure of going to the moon was built on the on the, the back of V two rockets. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, so so you know it, let's let's not discount evil too quickly uh, in this situation. But the uh, evil should, is a force. Can we for measure good. the impact of evil as well? Maybe well, we should uh, take apparently that into you can absolutely. God, you're probably more easily to be honest. That's uh, a slogan, yeah. election slogan, isn't it? Evil, evil is a force work. for good. After yeah. all your <laughs> stuff there, where you've gone on and, and you know, and, and it's really underfunded. And, and the other thing, actually, which has been fantastic for our GDP, has been evil, uh, even better than science. Well, if we can combine should, the well, two, perhaps scientists should look at as they're filling out their, their, you know, as they're writing their hypothesis down. They should go, well, what would an evil me do? Uh, this is what I would do here, but maybe evil me would take it. Maybe you just need that little different viewpoint on it. And that could be the 10% yeah. kind of weighting in Absolutely. the research assessment. Absolutely. The evil, evil. evil people have a tendency to be much more goal-oriented, uh, much less blue sky. <laughs> so the next things. time Brian puts a grant application in, if he attaches a little photo of himself on the front stroking a long-haired white cat, white cat yeah. it's going to have a much better chance. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a two-headed cat, look what I made, Molly, yeah. then it's even better, isn't it? Um, on the level of evil, I think we've actually get got to the end of the show we started off as a force for good we've actually ended up promoting evil 
<laughs> Dara O'Brien and Alice Roberts, thank you very much. Uh, next week we'll be discussing UFOs, uh, science conspiracies and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence with Seth Shostak, who is indeed from SETI. That is their job, to find extraterrestrial intelligence. And John Ronson, who has been out in the deserts with Robbie Williams to find UFOs, so he's got his own personal take on UFO hunting. If you know what Infinite Monkey Cage means, because we're still a bit uncertain, get in touch with us. We're not going to tell you how, because that exercise number one. Goodbye. If you've enjoyed this programme, you might like to try other Radio 4 podcasts, from Friday Night Comedy and Daily Drama from the Archers to a range of news, discussions and documentaries. For a full list of available podcasts, visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4.